Amen. Well, it's so good to be back with you all this morning. I had the opportunity last week to be in another church. Uh, There's a a friend who has a church in Kansas City who was out of town. He asked if I would come and speak, so I got a chance to do that, which is great, but I missed being here, and I would have rather been here with you all. It's so good to be here, to see your faces, to lift our voices together in worship, and I'm excited to, uh, to be back here at Redemption Hill this morning and back into the book of Luke. So if you would please open... Uh, your copy of the scriptures to Luke chapter 16. Our text this morning will be Luke 16, verses 1 through 13. I'll read that passage and then we'll pray and we'll jump into it together. Luke chapter 16, verse 1 through 13. Luke chapter 16, he also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do. So that when I'm removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then... You have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth. Who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Heavenly Father, as we approach this morning... Our Bibles are open. We also recognize that our hearts must be open. Our minds must be open. Our wills must be submitted. Our desires must be aligned with yours. And even as we sang already, we, we know that this isn't just the result. This kind of a posture towards you, this kind of receptiveness is, is not the result of good preaching. No preacher can make that happen in someone's heart. It's not even the result of of us just trying hard and wanting it badly. We need your spirit to to work in us and and make us open and make us receptive and enable us to receive and understand and believe and obey everything that you have to say. So we come to you with our confession of this need. We need you to do your work in your people through your word today. And we ask that you do all that for your glory. So speak to us now, Lord, and may our hearts, as we sang, truly be an altar of worship towards you as we give you our love with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. So we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God cares about how you handle your money. He cares about your attitude towards your money. He cares about the decisions and the choices you make with your money. He cares about your planning. He cares about your priorities. He cares about your investments or your lack thereof. He cares about your financial goals. He cares about your financial strategies. And we know this because Jesus talks about money quite a lot in the Gospels. And he does this not because God wants our money. In fact, God doesn't need our money. God is not hard up. He's not asking you for a favor, okay, or me. He doesn't need anything from us. The reason God cares about our money is because God cares about our heart, and he wants our heart, and he wants his servants to leverage the resources he's entrusted to us for his glory, for his purposes. That's why God cares about how you handle your money. 
Now, this topic of finances is highly relevant for us because, as you know, we live in an affluent society. All of us manage money of, at some level. Uh, I'm going to ask the little kids in the room, little kids, raise your hand if you have a bank account, if you have a piggy bank, maybe, with some money saved up. How many of you guys have money? Raise your hand. Raise them high, even if you're five years old. Okay, all of us manage money, even if you're deciding whether to get the king size or the regular size Snicker bar at the gas station, right? We all have been entrusted with money to make. So this is, this is highly relevant for us, but this topic is also highly sensitive. If you want to make someone uncomfortable and end a conversation, just ask them how much they make. <laughs> ask them how much they owe on their car or how, how much they paid for their house. Ask them those kinds of questions. Ask them, here's a good one, ask them how much they give at church. Well, that's a conversation killer, like right away. We're private. We get, we get very defensive when issues of money come, come up. But listen, Jesus is serious about getting into our business because it's actually not our business. It's his. So if you're serious about following and honoring Christ, then you're going to be serious about how you handle your material wealth. And that's what this text is about. Of the roughly 40 parables that Jesus tells in the New Testament, I'll be honest, this is one of the trickier ones. Commending a dishonest manager, praising this man, or this is a little bit difficult for us sometimes to understand, but I believe the point becomes clear as we work through it. This parable serves really as an extended introduction of sorts to set up these principles that Jesus is teaching, the principles we find in verses 9 through 13. And, and the, the point that we come away with, the central idea for this text is this. I think what Jesus wants to get across and what we need to receive is this. Our use of wealth must reflect both the wisdom of Christ and the worship of Christ. The way you use wealth, the way you manage your possessions, your money, must reflect the wisdom of Christ and the worship of Christ. And when the wisdom and worship of Christ becomes the governing principle for us, for how we manage our resources, then we will be faithful with wealth rather than placing our faith in wealth. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. So let's jump into our, our text this morning. Right here in verse 1, we find that there's been a bit of a shift in the audience. Prior to this, Jesus has really been going after the Pharisees, the religious leaders, but now he turns and he speaks primarily to his disciples. Verse 1, he said this to the disciples. These are the ones who are receptive to his teaching, but also ones who are in need. They are in need of spiritual formation. They are in need of growth. They need to mature. They need to have their thinking and their perspective and their priorities shaped by the wisdom of their master. And so Jesus is going to give them some of that wisdom. So this is a bit of a shift in terms of the focus of who Jesus is speaking to. But bear in mind, the religious leaders are also listening. In fact, if you jump down to verse 14, right after the, the the close of our text this morning, it says, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. They ridiculed him. Jesus often used parables in situations like this, where he's got a mixed audience. He uses these parables because they reveal the truth to those who have soft hearts, those who want to follow Jesus, those who are submitted to him. But these same parables often also conceal the truth as really an act of judgment on people who are hostile towards Christ, those who have hard and unbelieving hearts. This is what Jesus showed us back in Luke chapter 8. He told his disciples in verse 10, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. So there's a number of different people in the room, so to speak, Jesus is primarily speaking, though, to his disciples, which makes this highly practical for us. If we are followers of Jesus, if you are a believer in Christ, if you've confessed your sins and believed in God's promise of salvation through the death and resurrection of his son, if, you're, if that's you, then this text is for you. So don't think about the other person who needs to hear it. This is what Christ has to say to all of us this morning. And the parable begins like this. He says, there was a rich man who had a manager. 
So just stop right there. He introduces these two main characters. He describes a man, first of all, who has such a large operation, this rich man, he has to hire somebody to manage it. Maybe he even lived in another place. He needed someone on site with boots on the ground to sort of run day-to-day operations. Believe it or not, there are people in the world like this. Multiple homes, multiple businesses, and you gotta hire people to take care of all of that stuff. And the size of this operation must have been considerable. Later, we'll see the the large debts, the high-value accounts that this man has. So this is a a large-scale operation. So there's the rich man, and he has this manager. He had a manager, sometimes called a steward. This is the Greek word oikonomos. It's a compound word that comes from the word from house and the word for law. So he runs things. Uh, The law of the house belongs to him. He manages things day to day. He's the CFO. He's the COO of the company, responsible for all of these things. He manages slaves. He takes care of business accounts. He makes management decisions all on behalf of the owner. But we see a problem here. The rich man has a manager. Verse 1, charges were brought to him, to the, the rich man, that this man was wasting his possessions. These accusations come to the owner about the kind of job the manager is doing, that he's wasting, that he's squandering his possessions. He's a bad manager. The word here for wasting is actually the same word that we saw in chapter 15 describing the prodigal son, squandering, wasting all of his inheritance. It's the same word. I think that's maybe why we find these stories back to back. It's a bit of a thematic link here. So it doesn't seem like the manager is embezzling or stealing He's just dropping the ball. He's doing such a bad job that the business is leaking, hemorrhaging money. So he's either negligent, he's just not doing his job, or he's incompetent. He doesn't know how to do a good job. Either way, this is a bad situation for this rich man. He's not the kind of guy you want running your business. So verse two, he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be manager. He says, wrap up any loose ends. Turn in your paperwork. He wants an inventory of where things are. He says, let me know where things stand, but then you can see yourself out and leave the keys on the desk. And the manager doesn't protest. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't try to explain. It seems that he knows, yeah, I am doing a pretty bad job. (laughs) He doesn't even protest. Instead of arguing back, what does he do? Well, we see his deliberations here in verses 3 and 4. The manager says to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. Now we start to see something happening with the manager that we also saw with the prodigal son. Funny how when life gets hard and all the painful circumstances start to hit you, then you start thinking about long-term consequences, right? So just like the prodigal son, this has sort of snapped him awake. His crisis has awakened him to his situation. He knows he's about to be out of a job. He'll have no income. Also, he'll likely have no home. It's probable that this man had to live there on the premises. So he's about to be unemployed. He's about to be homeless. And it's not like he can just go out and get a different job. His reputation is already ruined in the community. It's the people in the community that told his manager that he's or his, his boss, that he's a bad manager. So this doesn't leave him with a lot of options. Who else is going to hire him? You can sort of see him frantically sorting through all his options. He goes, I'm not strong enough to dig. He knows he's a white-collar worker. Maybe he's an older man. And he goes, I'm not cut out to be a farmhand. Digging ditches is hard work. I'll never last. Okay, so what are my other options? He goes, I'm too ashamed to beg. He can't imagine as someone who managed things at a high level being put in a position where he has to ask people for money and they're the people that he used to do the payroll for. They're the people he used to negotiate with for high level business deals. He can't imagine asking them for a handout. He's a proud man and that's simply not an option in his mind. It's beneath his dignity. I'm too ashamed to beg. Then he has his light bulb moment in verse four. He goes, aha, I've decided what to do. This kind of jumps out of the text. He knows his window of opportunity is quickly closing, but he's not out of options yet. He still has a chance to do something. So he hatches this plan of action for the present. He says, here's what I'm going to do right now with hopes that it will secure his future. Look in verse 4. I've decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, now he's thinking long term, 
people may receive me into their houses. His plan is to get his foot in the door with another businessman, another landowner perhaps, to build some sort of bridge with one of his master's clients so that he can sort of ingratiate himself or or obligate them to help him out um, in the near future when he is homeless and unemployed. He puts this plan into action in verses five through seven. He summoned his master's debtors one by one. Okay, all of a sudden, this, this bad manager is incredibly systematic. He's organized, he's detailed, he's intentional. All the things he should have been before. And he starts to cut some deals. The first owes him 100 measures of oil. He asks him, verse five, how much do you owe my master? It's kind of funny here. He probably knew, but he wants to remind this person, you're in pretty big debt, aren't you? He wants him to say it. He wants it to be clear how nice of a guy he is when he's about to offer this deal. The man answers, verse six, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Apparently his master didn't just deal in cash. He traded in commodities. Um, And this amount of oil would have been about 875 gallons. So this is a big, large amount. That's the yield, the annual yield of 150 olive trees. So this is a large amount, very valuable, worth about 1,000 denarii, three and a half years' salary for an average laborer. So this is a big debt. So he confirms the amount, and then he cuts it in half. He says, write 50. And we should note that this is not a payment. He's not collecting 50, uh, uh, 50 measures of oil. This is not a payment. He's, he's rewriting the note. He's cutting the debt. So now the man is still owes his master, but he owes half of what he did before. And he does the same thing with the second man. The second man owes a thousand measures of wheat. Estimates range from a smaller amount to a larger amount. Some historians suggest that this could have been the yield from a hundred acres of wheat. So it's another big debt. And he tells him, you should cut it down to 80. And this is where it gets a little hard for us to figure out exactly, okay, what's his angle? What exactly is he doing Does he have the authority to do this? Is he cheating his master? Is is there some sort of fine print? What's going on? There's really three options as we try to figure out what this man is doing. The, the The simple way to read it is maybe he's just reducing the bill. Giving them a discount. Some of you have had medical bills, maybe with a, at the hospital or something like that. And they just want to get paid some amount at the end. So often you can call and you can negotiate that, for, you know, that, that bill down to a lower amount. Maybe he's just cutting the bill down so his master can get paid in a more timely fashion and sort of close the account. That's one option. But it's also possible that what he's doing here is actually removing interest from the debt. If you read the Old Testament law, it actually forbid the Jewish people from charging interest to their countrymen. But the Jewish people often found loopholes. They would find ways to charge interest without calling it interest in order to make a profit. And they would justify the practice in you know, all sorts of ways. You know? And so maybe that's something that's going on here. Maybe he's saying, you know what? I'm going to remove all the interest and say all you owe is the principle of the debt. And by doing that, he would not only make himself look generous, and he's making friends here with, with these clients, but he would also make himself look righteous. He would put his boss in a position to not be able to publicly accuse him of doing something wrong. If the boss came and said, hey, you shouldn't cut that down. You hurt my pocketbook. He would say, well, boss, you're not supposed to be charging these, these, these brothers of yours interest anyway. So, so he's sort of salvaging his reputation publicly, looking good. And at the same time, he's also sort of sticking it to his boss. That, that's one possible way that this scheme could be unfolding. There's also a third way you could read it. It's also been argued by some that the manager is just cutting his own commission out of the final bill. Uh, Maybe this was his own personal profit, that he was increasing and inflating the debts, you know, to make himself some money. And so now he's just sort of saying, you know what, all you owe is what you owe my master. He's going to forego what he's owed because he knows he won't be around to collect it in the future anyway. So he makes his master whole. He makes friends uh, with these clients and hoping that in the long term, Maybe they'll scratch his back someday because he just scratched theirs. So we really don't know for certain. Is he, is he doing something shifty and cutting into his, his, his owner's or his boss's uh, financial profits? Is he just foregoing his own, his own commission? Is he reducing the interest? We don't know. But here's what we can know. None of these customers complained. 
They all were more than happy to sit down quickly and rewrite the debt in their own hand. I'm sure they all left with a glad surprise that their debt was reduced. So whatever the justification for the offer is, this manager was right in anticipating that such an offer would be quickly received by his master's debtors. But what's really fascinating is what happens in verse 8. The master now enters the scene again. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. He's commended by the master. He goes, nice move. I see what you did there. Now, it's important we note he's not commending him for being dishonest. In fact, the word dishonest is really a word that's more often translated unrighteous. He, that's the, the assessment of his character from prior to all of this. He was a bad manager. He had been wasting his master's possessions. Because of that, he's unrighteous. He's dishonest. He, he's a poor, incompetent, negligent manager. He's not commending him for that. He's commending him for his shrewdness. He says, no matter what you did before, all of your bad moves in the past, this is really a good move. And he commends him for his shrewdness. The formerly incompetent manager somehow found it in himself to turn a pink slip into a promotion, as it were. So he gets a pat on the back for his street smarts, for being savvy. He goes, wow, you really had it in you after all, you clever rascal. Smart move, I've got to hand it to you. So he doesn't get his job back, but the master does tip his cap. So this is the parable that Jesus tells. But then Jesus shows us the reason why he's telling the story in the first place. He identifies a problem. Now he's back in the real world. Now he's looking at his disciples. He's looking at his followers. He's looking at all the people who are sitting there listening to his story. And he makes this statement in the second half of verse 8. And he gives this little linking word, for. Now you see the reason for the story. He says, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. The sons of this world are more shrewd dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Now we see why Jesus shared this story in the first place. And we ask the question, what is Jesus saying? He's saying that we Christians should wheel and deal, that we should be absolute sharks in the business world, that we should be shrewd and cunning with our money, even manipulative or, or even dishonest potentially. Well, no, that, that's not the point that Jesus is making. Here's the point. We could sort of uh, maybe paraphrase it this way. The sons of this world refers to those that walk in spiritual darkness, lost people, people who don't know God. There's many of them all around us. And he says that those people often give careful thought and, and really make intentional choices in light of their own financial and physical future, their future in this world specifically. Jesus says they're shrewd, they're calculating, they're savvy. They think ahead and they invest accordingly. When it comes to worldly matters, worldly things, their business ventures, their money, their investments, their accounts. And he says, and, and here's the sad reality. The sons of light, speaking of believers, those who do know God, those who do know the truth, those who've had their eyes opened, the sons of light really should give careful thought and make intentional choices in light of our eternal and spiritual future. But too often we don't. We lack perspective. When it comes to the things of eternity and our responsibilities and our investments and our resources, we can often be sloppy. We can be lazy. We can be short-sighted. We fail to pay attention to the things that really matter and fail to prepare for our future, not a physical financial future in this world, our eternal future in the kingdom of God. And we don't invest as we should. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe in the return of Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the resurrection of the saints from the dead? Do you believe that there's a great kingdom coming where Christ will rule, where there will be a glorious administration that he heads and that the saints are going to rule with him and that we will receive various degrees of responsibility and reward that reflect our sacrifice and our service in this life? Yes, that's our, that's our understanding of the future. That's what Scripture clearly reveals. If that's true, then why don't we act like it? Why do we make financial choices 
that are rooted in foolishness, rooted in fear, rooted in selfishness, or worldly ambitions that don't matter for eternity. Why is that? Jesus' point is that there's some lost people that are better at preparing for their future than we are in preparing for ours. And that's a rebuke. That's a criticism. And if it stings, it should. So what do we do? Well, Jesus doesn't just make that statement, sort of cut us open, and then walk away and leave us bleeding. No, he records several statements here where Jesus gives positive instruction, showing us here's how we should live. Instead of being naive, instead of being foolish, instead of being lacking the perspective we should have on the future, Jesus lays out positive teaching that shows us the kind of perspective we should have, how we should handle our wealth, what it looks like for us to be shrewd and calculating in the right way regarding our finances and the resources we have in this life. He lays out these principles in verses 9 through 13. So if we don't want that critique to apply to us, if we don't want to be one of the sons of light who's not even as shrewd or as savvy as lost people, then our use of wealth must reflect the wisdom and the worship of Christ. And when the wisdom and worship of Christ becomes the governing principle for us, then we will be faithful with our wealth instead of placing our faith in our wealth. Here's the three principles. Number one, number one, the wisdom of Christ leads to generosity with our finances. The wisdom of Christ, as we receive his perspective, his truth, we embrace his values The wisdom of Christ leads to generosity with our finances. And Jesus tells us this in verse 9. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Here's the deal. Money is meant to be used. It's meant to be used. Spending it is one way to use it. Saving it is another way to use it. Whatever you do with it, you're using it. But what do we use it for? What's the goal of how we spend, how we save, where we put our money? Well, Jesus says that an important use of money, what he calls unrighteous wealth, meaning it's just worldly wealth, it's from this world, it's from this system, it, it, has, it doesn't have moral value in and of itself. One of the key purposes for our use of money is to bless other people. He says, make friends with others. Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. When Jesus says, make friends by means of unrighteous wealth, he's not saying you should try to buy favors from people or sort of attract people with your money. Rather, he's urging us. He's saying, listen, you need to invest in people. Don't just invest in your portfolio. People are more important than those other things. He's saying we should use our money to bless others instead of just using it to please ourselves and our own immediate interests. He's urging his disciples to be generous. Hebrews 13, 16 says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And actually, this is to be one of our goals for acquiring wealth. You should try to make money. I mean, Paul says in Ephesians 4, 28, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. Why? So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. He says we should work hard and we should try to get paid so that we can be a blessing to other people. That's one of the goals of it. And this shows the right attitude towards wealth and the right attitude towards eternity. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, As for the rich in this present age... Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. We are to be generous towards other people. And listen, when we communicate love in this way, when we serve others in this way, when we bless others in this way by our generosity, 
by utilizing the means that God has given us to, to meet their need, something special happens. Not only are, is their immediate need met, that's a good thing, not only even is virtue demonstrated that pleases God, like Hebrews says, such sacrifices are pleasing to God. But in addition to that, there's also an eternal consequence. Our generosity here leads to a future blessing there. This is not the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that says if you give money away, God's going to make you rich right now. I mean, maybe he will, maybe he won't. There's no guarantee of that. But there is a guarantee that what you give away now will be blessed and recognized in eternity. Jesus brings out one of these blessings. Verse 9, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. Why? So that when it fails, and it will, we will die. The world itself is going to pass away. This age will fade into history when the kingdom comes and a new age is established. Make friends so that when that wealth fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. The failings of of momentary wealth and the eternal lasting dwelling place of heaven. That's what Jesus is contrasting here. And he says they will receive you. Again, this is a little hard for us to interpret. Maybe he's referring to the grateful fellowship of the saints uh, in the future kingdom. Maybe it's referring to the angels who welcome us into heaven. Some have thought maybe this is even a roundabout sort of respectful way to refer to God. In any case, what's clear is that Jesus is pointing us to the future. That's the point. He's pointing us to a future blessing, a future return on your investment. Being generous now gives us an expectation and a hope for the future. And it shows faith. It shows that we believe and we hope in and we trust in God's promise of what will come. Jesus taught us this in Luke chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Plain. He said, love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Jesus isn't hinting that you can earn your way into heaven by your generosity. Far from it. Our only access into heaven is bought not with our money, not with our generosity, but with the generosity of Jesus Christ who gave us his life and shed his blood for our sins. That's what secures our entrance into into heaven. But there's additional blessings to being there. I mean, just being there is enough. But there's additional reward and blessing that does reflect our good works and our obedience in this life. And Jesus says that those who believe in him should be marked by an open-hearted, open-handedness with our money. And that such generosity results in a great and joyous reward in the age to come. We all know you can't take it with you. It's been said lots of times. You you won't see a U-Haul behind a hearse, right? You can't take it with you. When you die, your money, your stuff, your house, all the things that we get preoccupied with, it's going to be somebody else's. It's going to get divvied up amongst others. Maybe your kids, maybe the government, maybe a little bit of both. Who knows? And who knows how they're all going to use it, right? You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead in a sense, You can waste it now, but you'll see no return in the future. But if you invest it now by giving it away, the future blessing makes it all worth it. That's the eternal perspective that Jesus is getting out here. That's the wisdom of Christ. And the wisdom of Christ is reflected in generosity. That's the first principle Jesus gives us. The wisdom of Christ is reflected in our generosity with our finances. But there's a second principle. It's in verses 10 through 12. Number two, the wisdom of Christ leads to faithfulness with our finances. It not only is reflected in generosity, but it leads to faithfulness with our finances. Look in verses 10 through 12. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth... Who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? In verse 10 here, we find a very matter-of-fact statement about character, about our integrity. Jesus says, if you're the kind of person who's faithful with a little bit, with a little bit of money, with a little bit of responsibility, with a little bit of authority, with a little bit of opportunity then you're the kind of person who will also be entrusted with more and be able to handle more. But if you can't handle a little bit, adding more is not going to change that. I was listening to Pastor John MacArthur comment on this text this week. 
And it sort of cracked me up. He's preaching on this message, and he said, so some of you say, well, I don't give much because I don't have much. If I had more, I'd give more. And he goes, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> no, if you had more, you wouldn't give any more. And you say, how do you know that? You don't know me. And he says, well, Jesus does. <laughs> if you're faithful and little, you'll be faithful with much. And if you're not, you won't be. That, that's what verse 10 says. It's a matter-of-fact statement about reality. So we have to be careful about the line of thinking that goes, you know, once I get a better job, then I'll be able to, you know, be more intentional with my, with my money, more generous, more disciplined. You know, once I have a family and it matters more, then I'll sort of kick that into gear. You know what? Once we aren't newlyweds anymore and we sort of get our feet under us, then we'll start giving more consistently. Or you know what? Once we don't have teenagers, because teenagers burn through clothes and they eat a ton of food and they burn a ton of gas and... It's hard wear and tear on your house, all of that. Once we don't have teenagers, then, then we'll be freed up to be a little more, you know, uh, focused and intentional about being generous to others. You know, once we pay the car off, once we pay the house off, maybe once we get through this busy season, maybe once we don't have kids in college, maybe once we aren't trying to recover from having teenagers and kids in college, or may, you know, maybe once we sort of get, you know, that promotion, or once I get the raise, maybe once I get that inheritance money... <laughs> It's always if only. It's always tomorrow. And we tend to think, once my situation's different, then I will be different. Jesus says it's not like that. You are who you are right now. Whether you have a little, whether you have a lot. With your money, with your time, with your opportunities, your responsibilities, your place of ministry in the church, your integrity, your job, you are who you are right now. Your priorities today are your priorities. So how you manage or don't manage your money really reflects your character, your integrity, your maturity. And Jesus says, listen, there needs to be faithfulness in my followers. That's what I want to see, faithfulness. And I want to clarify here, the amount of money you have is not always the key indicator of your faithfulness. So don't read this text to say, well, if that person doesn't have much money, maybe God, you know, is punishing them for not being faithful with their finances. And just because that person has a lot of money, they must have been super obedient and faithful all the time. That's not always the case. You can be on the lower end of the economic spectrum and do a really good job and be super faithful with what the Lord has entrusted to you. You can also have a lot of extra cash, but be really poor at managing it in terms of how God evaluates things. Here's the real question. Is the wisdom of Christ reflected in your management of your material assets? Are you faithful? Are you faithful with whatever amount it is that's been entrusted to you right now? Are you wasteful or are you wise? Do you pay your bills on time? Do you carry a lot of bad credit card debt? Are you a faithful caretaker of your own property and respectful of the property of others? The place you live, the car you drive, whatever it is. Are you the kind of person who's habitually late? Do you keep your promises and keep your commitments? Are you the kind of person who brings order and fruitfulness in your home and in your business and wherever, whatever it is you're involved in? It, it, does that describe you? Jesus says, if you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. But if you're not faithful with with a little that I've given you now, then you shouldn't expect in the age to come to be entrusted with greater responsibilities. You see, Jesus doesn't just want disciples who sit around and you know, sit on the ground with their, their legs crossed and think about doctrine all day, 24-7. We should study. We should think on truth. But listen, Jesus wants followers who take that truth and embrace it and then live it out. They get up and they go to work and they give it their best and, and they make money and they manage it well. Jesus wants followers who know him and who follow him and they pursue faithfulness every day in every area of life. And that includes how we manage our time and our resources and our money and all of those things. You see, that approach to all of life reflects a heart that is ruled by the wisdom of Christ because you get it. You have the right perspective. You recognize what matters, and you know that Christ desires faithfulness in his followers, to be faithful stewards with whatever it is that he's given to us. That shows a heart that's ruled by the wisdom of Christ, a heart that knows the future and so strives to be faithful in the present. 
So the wisdom of Christ is shown in our generosity and our faithfulness, but there's a third principle Jesus shares, and it's this. Number three, the worship of Christ is to rule our heart, not finances. It's to be the worship of Christ, not the worship of stuff, the worship of material gain, the worship of money. It's to be the worship of Christ that rules our heart. Look in verse 13. Famous words by our Savior that we return to over and over again because it's so important. Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You know, today, these days, you can have two jobs. So you can have two bosses. Some of you work multiple jobs. But in the first century, in the context here of being a household slave, being someone like the manager in the story, you couldn't be in two places at once. You couldn't belong to two owners at once. You couldn't work in two fields in two different places at the same time. You couldn't clean two kitchens in two different houses at the same time. This is a statement of common sense. You cannot serve two masters. And the same is true, Jesus says, when it comes to the ultimate loyalty and the worship of your heart. You can't serve two masters. You can't love and trust and fear and desire money ultimately and love and trust and fear and desire Christ ultimately. It's either or. Jesus spells it out for us just in case we didn't get it in the first sentence. He says, you're either going to hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. It's either or. And the word here for hate sort of reminds us of what Jesus said in chapter 14, verse 26, when he said, if anyone does not hate his father and mother and and his other family members and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. The word hate there is not talking about about, um, being disgusted by or, or having malice towards the object of hate. This is a word that reflects loyalty, really covenant loyalty. Are you ultimately loyal to Christ or to your family? Are you ultimately loyal to your bottom line or to Christ? That's the question. You're either going to hate one and love the other or hold to the one and despise the other. When push comes to shove and they both ask you to say yes, you're going to say no to one. Who's it going to be? Are you willing to say no to money, to financial gain, to financial security when push comes to shove? Because really, this is a worship issue. It's a worship issue. What has the first place in your heart? Is it money and the things that money potentially gets for you? Or is it Christ? What's, your high, what's the highest object of your trust and your fear and your desire? We want to be faithful with our finances. That's what Christ calls us to. But there's always a temptation to put our faith in our finances. That's what Jesus is getting at here. That's a strong temptation. Because money offers us things, doesn't it? It offers us pleasure in the things it can buy for you. Entertainment, trips, food, toys. There's a lot of cool stuff out there that money can buy you. Money also offers us status and prestige, the respect and the admiration of others. It's a marker of success in our world, in our society. It makes you look like a winner. If you can amass it, you sort of use it to set yourself apart as one of the people that made it to the top. You're successful, and some of us crave that recognition, and we, we want to have that success. Money also offers you safety, peace of mind, security. If you can just get the right insurance policies and the right retirement plan, and you can save up enough for the future, then you feel protected against whatever it is that may come. Money offers us all of those things. And whatever your particular inclination is, whatever your temptations are, money can sort of adapt to whatever that is and suggest that maybe more money is the solution. But listen, the happiness and honor, the glory, the peace that we are longing for, searching for, the safety, these are things we must seek in Christ and from Christ. You see, who you serve, it really reveals your functional Savior, your functional God. Whatever you think it is that can really solve all your problems, that's who you're looking to for salvation. That's your God. That's the object of your faith. And listen, money is a terrible Savior. 
It's a terrible savior. There are some in every age who try to ride the fence and try to serve two masters, and even some who are just drawn away by the empty promises of worldly wealth. They think maybe it can really give them what they want most desperately. But listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 6. He says, those who desire to be rich, maybe they think it will satisfy them. They think it will keep them safe. They think it will make them feel like they're not a failure. They think it'll give them the experiences or the possessions or, or the status that they've always wanted. Those who desire to be rich, whatever the reason, they fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It's not just that money can't save you. If you put your faith in money, it will ruin you. It will wreck you. It will destroy you. If you give your heart to money, it leads to disaster. But listen, if you give your heart to Christ, that leads to eternal life. That leads to true peace. That leads to true security. That leads to true and lasting joy. That leads to true honor and glory. That leads to eternal life. That's what Jesus offers. Money cannot save you. The moment you die, it's all gone. It's for someone else to divvy up and spend and distribute. Go read Ecclesiastes, right? That's the message. Money cannot save you. Money also cannot satisfy you. All the things that money buys are temporary. They rust, they rot, and the moments of pleasure, they pass quickly. All you have to do is look at the wealthiest people in our society, the people who have it all, the people who've made it to the top. They have all the glory, all the toys, all the control over their own situation financially. They get to the top and they realize it's not what they thought it would be, and they're miserable. Maybe they try something else to make them happy for a while. They end up depressed. They end up medicating themselves. They end up despairing of life because money didn't deliver on its promises. Listen, only Christ can save and only Christ can satisfy. And listen, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian and you're sort of saying, okay, well, how, what am I supposed to do today? Does this mean I need to put a $20 bill in the box as I walk out the door? Listen, we don't want your money. Please don't. We don't need your money. Here's what you need to do today. What you need to do is not just give some money to God. God wants your heart. You need salvation it's not that God needs something from you. You need something from God. And he offers it to you through his son, Jesus Christ. You need forgiveness. You need a clean heart. You need a new heart. You need to be made alive. You need to be reconciled with God. You need hope for eternal life. And only Christ can give that to you. So come to the cross today and lay down your sins. Confess your need to him. Ask him to save you. Turn away from your whatever it is you've been trusting in and seeking after and holding on to. Let go of all that and receive Christ. He will save you. He will give you hope for eternity. He will reconcile you with God. He will cleanse you of your sins. He will give you a new heart, new desires, and a new purpose and a new identity. Listen, only Christ can save you. So serve him, worship him, fear him, trust him. Seek him. He is a treasure far greater than anything money can buy you and a treasure that no amount of worldly wealth can even compare to. Ephesians 3.8, Paul, as he's preaching the gospel, says, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable riches of Christ. God doesn't need your money. But you need the unsearchable riches of Christ. And that's what God has given us in his son. So receive him today. Which will it be? Will Jesus be your master? Will he be your treasure? Or will it be worldly wealth? Unrighteous wealth that fails. Will you own your wealth? Or will your wealth own you? That's the question. Jesus draws a line in the sand. And he says, you have to choose. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Our use of wealth must reflect 
brothers and sisters, the wisdom of Christ and the worship of Christ. How we use our money is a litmus test. It tells us who we really are. It tells us the state and condition of our heart. And listen, we need to be faithful with wealth instead of placing our faith in wealth. So I'll, I'll leave you with this. Leave you with this question, this little thought experiment. What would happen today if your boss, the Lord Jesus Christ, were to show up and he were to say to you, give me a record of your accounts, just like that rich man did with his manager? What would be placed on the table? What would you have to show? Maybe you need to make some changes today. By God's grace, he's not firing you. He's giving you a chance to repent. And he's showing you a path forward, showing you here's where you can grow. Here's how you can live. Here's what obedience to me looks like in your life. So make those changes today. And let Christ reign supreme over your finances. Seek to honor him. Learn a lesson from the shrewdness of this manager. Think about the future. Not just 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Think about 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 years from now. And consider that your time here is short. And you have a chance, a short window right now, to make the most of your options in using your means to invest in the age to come. So don't waste any more time. Don't waste any more money. Jesus calls us to a life of wisdom and worship that serves his purposes and trusts in his promises. May we receive this word from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, today. Would you pray with me? Lord, it is convicting to just think about how we would answer that question if you were to show up and ask us to put our accounts on the table. Lord, I pray that for those of us who maybe feel the sting of this rebuke this morning, that you would help us not to leave here simply motivated by guilt, just trying harder to sort of, you know, check off some boxes so we can feel like a better Christian. I pray that we would really recognize the value of Christ, that we would recognize the value and the glory of eternity. I pray we would be inspired by and motivated by the love you have shown to us as you have given us eternal, immeasurable, unsearchable riches. I pray that our joy and our confidence and our gratitude would overflow, and that it would shape the way we live, that we would walk with wisdom, that we would worship you over all. And Lord, for those who may not know you today, who've come here, who are curious or seeking, well, Lord, I pray that they would walk away from here not just thinking about money. They would walk away thinking about Christ. Walk, here, walk out of here thinking about the salvation that is found in him. And I pray that if there's anything holding them back, if there's something else they've been trusting in, to satisfy them, to fulfill them, to save them, to keep them safe, to give them an identity and a sense of accomplishment. I pray that they would repent of that, that they would recognize the emptiness of that, that they would look to Jesus and recognize he is the way and the truth and the life. And it's only through him that we can come to the Father. So I pray that they would believe in the, the good news of the gospel that salvation is a free gift of grace given to all who believe. Lord Jesus, may you receive the glory as we go from here. I pray this in your name. Amen.